good evening, everybody. Welcome to our talk on the autism spectrum. I see some familiar faces in the audience. And, uh, you know, here we are, smack dab in the middle of Autism Awareness Month. How many of you knew that April was Autism Awareness Month? Oh, wow. We've got a pretty knowledgeable audience here, John. Well, you know, I have to admit, when I first came up with the idea for this talk, it was last November. And at that time, I didn't even know there was such a thing as Autism Awareness Month. In fact, I, I submitted my proposal and, and I asked, you know, is there a slot in the spring schedule for my talk? And eventually they got back to me, said, yeah, you're scheduled for April 13th. And still, I didn't know that was Autism Awareness Month. In fact, I didn't find out until I was doing some research for my talk. So it was only about a month or two ago that I, I came up uh, came upon something and said, oh, April is Autism Awareness Month. So how appropriate that I'm giving a talk on Autism Awareness in Autism Awareness Month. Now, not only that, it's the middle of the Christian Holy Week. You know, and I would like to find a connection between autism and holiness, but I haven't quite worked that out yet. <laughs> but still, I do feel like the idea for this talk was divinely inspired. So what are my credentials? Well, my credentials are that I am on the autism spectrum. So who better to tell you what it's like than, this, for, than somebody who's actually on the spectrum. I'm on what they call the high functioning end. But take that with a grain of salt. You see, high functioning is just in relation to others of my kind. Um, you know, it's like with sloths. I'm sure that biologists who study sloths notice that uh, some sloths are more energetic than other sloths. But, but to point to a particular sloth and say, you know, that's an energetic sloth, you probably wouldn't picture that sloth swinging from tree to tree like Tarzan, would you? Well, likewise, if you hear it said that, you know, that guy Jeff writes, he has high functioning autism, you would be well advised to temper your expectations. Because if truth be told, I struggle just to maintain basic competency in my daily life. Now, uh, joining me is my faculty colleague, John Taylor. Now, I'm not sure, but I don't think John is on the autism spectrum. But nevertheless, he has a valuable perspective, and I could guarantee you that he is high functioning. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. is because I'm the parent of a child with autism. My son, Zach, who is 23, has autism. And actually, he is the reason I'm here in Garrett County living with my family. We used to live in West Virginia, and there are very, very limited um, services for adults with disabilities in the state of West Virginia. And when we found that out, we decided to move so that Zach would have the opportunity to, to have those services. And we are so, so pleased with everything that he has received here in Garrett County and in Maryland because it's giving him an opportunity to live his life the way it should be. So, Jeff, I'll turn it back to you. Well, okay, I've already told you that I'm on the autism spectrum. I could have said that I have Asperger's syndrome, but that, that term is now slightly dated. Or I could have said that I have autism spectrum disorder. But you know, I don't like that word disorder. Well, because, you know, to be put on the autism spectrum is based largely on your conduct in social situations. So if, if I'm on the autism spectrum and it's a disorder, then to my way of thinking, I must be guilty of disorderly conduct. <laughs> now, another reason I don't like that disorder is because who gets to decide what's a disorder and what's not? 
I'll tell you who gets to decide. The majority decides. And I often wonder, what if I lived in Finland instead of America? You know, in Finland, when you get on a bus or a train, you're not expected to make eye contact with anybody. You just keep your eyes down and, and you find your seat. And, and, and once you sit down, you're not expected to make conversation with the person sitting next to you. So I would fit right in in Finland. Nobody would find me strange in Finland. And I like to imagine that uh, maybe like a Finn who is excessively chatty and gregarious, maybe they would be put in a category stamped disorder, you know, like chattiness disorder or something, you know? So it's all a matter of perspective, isn't it? Well, anyway, uh, so I don't like the word disorder. I like to say that I am on the autism spectrum. Because to my ears, that carries a hint of mystery or intrigue. You know, like, see that tall, skinny guy over there who rarely speaks? I hear he's on the autism spectrum. Ooh, you don't say. Yeah, so uh, the original title for tonight's presentation was a bit longer. It was originally a thrilling life of adventure and romance <laughs> on the autism spectrum. But we had to shorten it for a couple of reasons. For one, uh, that longer title just wouldn't fit on those posters that I put up around campus advertising the Joan Crawford lecture series. And the, uh, the other reason is that we had to remove words like uh, adventure and romance is that, uh, well, uh, well, there ain't going to be none of that. <laughs> and I'm sorry, if that's what you came for, it's too late to refund your tickets. <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. Of course we'll refund your tickets. You see, that was an example of what I call Aspergian humor. You see, that's, that's a type of humor that those of us on the spectrum find funny, but, but we understand that those of you who are neurotypical, you don't find that funny. We get that. But still, I will be using Aspergian humor throughout the presentation this evening. Not to garner laughs, but just simply to demonstrate a certain facet of our personalities. So feel free not to laugh. In fact, the sensitive soul that I am, if you laugh, I just might take it as you're laughing at me. <laughs> so, so feel free not to laugh. Um, let's see, now where was I? Um, oh yeah, so uh, we, we removed the words adventure and, and, uh, and romance and thrilling. I don't want you to get the idea, though, that my life is devoid of thrills. I mean, I could regale you with stories of thrills and daring do for the entire hour. I mean, I could tell you about the time that I rocked the house at karaoke night at a bar in Wilton, New Hampshire. Or I could tell you about the time that I saw an orange variant of a scarlet tanager in a park in Vestal, New York. Or I could tell you about the many times that I've biked all the way up Piney Mountain without stopping. And I could keep on going. But you know, I would be giving you the wrong impression. You would be sitting there thinking, oh, if only I were on the autism spectrum. But you see, it's not as glamorous as it may appear. In fact, those of us on the spectrum face certain challenges every single day of our lives. And I hope you brought a hanky or some tissues because certain aspects of it can be kind of sad. But still, the last thing we want is for you to walk out of here tonight thinking, oh boy, that was a downer. 
So we're going to try to keep it upbeat and mix some strawberries in with the bran flakes. So let's get started. John, what is this thing called the autism spectrum? Can anybody be on it? Well, not everybody, but some people can. One of the things we want to keep in mind initially is that the rate of autism has changed significantly over the years. And just to give you an example, back in the early 1960s in Europe, the rate of autism was about 1 in 2,500. Today, in the United States, it's 1 in 44. So there has been a, a significant change in that rate. However, though, we also need to look at the fact that the diagnostic criteria have changed over the years. And just to give you an example, <clears throat> originally we had multiple facets of the autism disorder. We had autism, we had a condition called PDD-NOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, and those were students who had some of the characteristics of autism, but not all of them. We also had Asperger's syndrome, as Jeff had talked about. And one of the biggest difference between a person who has autism and a person who has Asperger's syndrome is the fact that people with Asperger's syndrome typically have very good language skills when they're younger compared to those individuals with autism. And I'll talk about my son, Zach, how he progressed with his language later on tonight. We also had conditions such as Rett syndrome and childhood disintegrative disorder. But when the big change happened in terms of the diagnostic criteria of autism was about the 1990s. And we saw a big influx of individuals being diagnosed at that time. One of the things that was going on was that school systems started diagnosing students more often. And we saw some change in the criteria to be diagnosed with, with autism. But the biggest change occurred in 2013 when the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual 5 came out and they made some significant changes to the disorders. And one of the things they did is they combined all of those disorders I just talked about into one category, which are autism spectrum disorders. <clears throat> and just to give you an example about how that change made an impact on the number of people diagnosed. I'll give you an example of a study out of Great Britain. After that diagnosis occurred, or that change occurred in DSM-5, there was a study done in Great Britain where they took 27 people who at one time had been diagnosed with some type of a disability, not autism or Asperger's syndrome. When they applied the, do, the, the new diagnostic criteria under DSM-5, 24 out of those 27 individuals were then diagnosed as having some type of autism spectrum disorder. So that really increased the number of individuals who have been diagnosed with autism. So let's look at some of the criteria to be diagnosed as having an autism spectrum disorder. First of all, you have each of the three areas of social communication and interaction that you're, we're going to look at. You also have to fall into the category of at least two of four types of restrictive and repetitive behaviors. And we're going to eat, look at each of those categories here with the individual diagnostic criteria. So the individual has to have some type of a deficit in social communication. And one of the things we always want to keep in mind about the diagnosis of somebody with autism spectrum disorder is those characteristics have to occur within the first three years of that individual's life. Now sometimes those are missed or are misdiagnosed, but you have to see those behaviors in those first three years. And for my son, I knew Zach had autism when he was four months old. My doctorate is in special education, so that's what I've done for a living for 36 years. And I remember the day with both of my boys, I would always, when they were babies, I would sit in the chair and I would hold them in front of me and I would talk to them and I would sing to them. And I'll never forget the day when I was doing that with Zach and he started doing this, rocking back and forth. And I can tell you, as Dr. Taylor, it sent fear through me because I knew that Zach had autism. And I remember going to work the next day and, and sharing that 
with some of my coworkers, and they said, oh, no, you just know too much because of what you do. And I said, no, that's what I do for a living. I help diagnose kids. I said, he has autism. And then finally, he had the official diagnosis. So it's got to, again, occur in those first three years of life. So let's look at some of these specific criteria. First of all, the person has to have some type of a deficit in that social emotional reciprocity. They may not want to interact with somebody if somebody starts a conversation with them. And they may not know how to interact and continue to keep that process going. They may also not know how to initiate a conversation with someone. Secondly, they may have deficit in, in nonverbal communication too. And some of the things I want to point out here is the fact that many people with autism have very, very poor eye contact. Does anybody know why they have poor eye contact? Go ahead, excuse me. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of times people with autism, they don't look you in the eye, they look in you in the mouth. Because they also, they can't use multiple senses at once. So if I'm looking at you, I may not be hearing you. So it's easier to look you in the mouth because I'm not having to focus on your eyes. So that's something that we want to always keep in mind. <clears throat> Another thing too, many times people with autism don't read body language well. And so if I go up to Jeff or Jeff comes up to me, I know there's a point where I'm like, mm, I'm kind of uncomfortable here. But sometimes people with autism don't understand that, that need for personal space. Another issue that we sometimes see is just that ability to maintain and build friendships. I, I can say for Zach that Zach does not have a lot of friendships. But even though we've tried to set up those opportunities for him, a lot of times he, he just doesn't have that desire to go out and interact with other people. I'm not saying he doesn't do that. Right now he is out with a group of people. But he doesn't have that desire many times to initiate those friendships. And sometimes they don't know how to initiate those friendships, so they have to be taught through social skills training to be able to understand that. Now the other criteria that we see a lot of times with people with autism is those restrictive, those repetitive types of behaviors that they do over and over again. And the first one that we want to talk about tonight are what we call the self-stimulatory behaviors. And these are the movements such as the hand flapping that you sometimes see with individuals with, with autism. Sometimes it can be rocking. It can be movements of the eyes. It can be noises the individual makes. But all of those can be indicative of some type of autism spectrum disorder. Now one of the things I, I want to really stress, and I'm not saying anybody's going to do this, but I've, I've dealt with some situations in public schools where teachers would punish children because of their stereotypical behaviors. And you never want to do that because what that child is doing with that case, and I'm going to give you a, an example with Zach. For many years, Zach couldn't talk. And when your kid can't talk, you don't know what their needs are, and you don't know why they're doing things. And before we moved here, our house, we had a living room and a family room. And Zach would run from our family room to our living room, and he would do this. <laughs> and then he would walk back. I sat for hours watching that kid, trying to find out why he was doing that. And I'm an inquisitive person, and when you're trying to help your child, you want to know answers. But when your child can't tell you, you may not know. So finally, once Zach was able to talk, I asked him, I said, why do you do that? Or why did you? He said, because it helps me think. And, and what we, we know about individuals within the spectrum is that many times <clears throat> they do those self-stimulatory behaviors because there's too much stimuli out here and they're just trying to block everything out and focus. And I can tell you, if you ever see John Taylor and Zach Taylor in Walmart in Oakland, 
at least one time during that Walmart trip, you're going to see Zach. Just the other night he and I were there and he was, because there's too much going on in Walmart. There are too many people. There's too many lights. There's too many noises. So that is why those stereotypical behaviors occur. But again, we, we don't want to punish those behaviors. We want to try to redirect or take the, the individual to a, a quieter setting where they can more easily focus. Another thing here under this category, sometimes kids with autism line up their toys. That, that can be a, an indicator that this child might have some type of, of an autistic tendency. And then we also have echolalia, where the individual repeats what other people are saying. I know I worked with a, a high school student one time on a, a transition where we were going my job was to take a, an entire high school that was completely segregated and move all those kids into a regular high school. And one of the students I worked with had echolalia. And I would come in in the morning and I'd say, hey, Michael, how you doing today? And he'd be like, hey, Michael, how you doing today? Well, did you have a good evening? Well, did you have a good evening? And that's what you saw all the time. They pair it back and forth what somebody else is saying. Sometimes, too, those individuals will actually repeat entire TV shows. Sometimes, just the other night, we were, Lisa and I were downstairs and Zach was upstairs and I could hear him doing this TV show. And he did it out loud because they can remember that kind of stuff. Now, not everyone does that. And, and one of the things that's very, very important to keep in mind, if you have met one person with autism, and this is what Temple Grandin said, if you know who Temple Grandin is, the lady who is probably the best known person in the world with autism. She's a professor at Colorado State University, I believe. Uh, and l luckily, several years ago, Lisa and I got to spend one-on-one -on -one time with her. I was at a conference and she came and we just happened to end up in the same room. Nobody else was there and we just sat down and, and hung out together. And it was such uh, a great experience for us. But, but Temple Grandin says if you've met one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Everyone is different. Some, so many, too many times people think that everyone is the same in that category. I remember one time I was presenting at a national conference someplace and this lady came up to me and she said, it must be wonderful to have a son with autism. And I just looked at it like, what in the heck are you thinking? And I said, ma'am, why would you say that? And she said, well, you know, every one of those people have tremendous skills and they're so intelligent. I, and I asked her, I said, have you ever been around somebody with autism? And she was like, well, no, but I, I was a substitute aide and one day I was in a classroom where there was a kid and I said, ma'am, you saw one kid at one time with autism. So we can't lump everyone together because we have the Dr. Reitzes and then we have the individuals who are much lower function that we're going to talk about here in a second. <clears throat> Another thing that you see, and to put this in simpler terms, is that many individuals on the spectrum have an extreme need for sameness and routine. And if that routine is broken up, the individual can have a meltdown, they can have issues with anxiety, they can have fits, and sometimes even become violent. I know with Zach, when he was little, and again, he couldn't talk, so he couldn't tell us this, but every time we would not go by this yellow house going into our neighborhood, he would have a fit. And every time we would get to a stoplight, he would have a fit, or most times, and we couldn't understand why. Well, then finally, when he could talk, we said, why are you doing this? And he said, well, we didn't go by the yellow house. And we, one of the things was we didn't stop at the stoplight when it was yellow. And I was like, well, you know, you don't always get to the yellow on the stoplight. It doesn't happen all the time. So we worked with him and, and we would say, now, Zach, we're not going to go by the yellow house today or we're not going to get to the light when it's, it's yellow. And he's fine with that now. But that's an example of how that need for routine is so great for those individuals. <clears throat> Many times people can be focused on certain objects too. Zach's object when he was little was lint. And, and he, would, he would get lint from blankets and stuff and he would keep them. And I remember one time when he, when he finally was able to talk, 
he had a bunch of lint in the car and we got out and did something. He came back and he was like, oh, lint, I've missed you, lint. <laughs> and one day I remember driving and I looked up in the, the rear view mirror and he had taken that lint and made it into this huge mustache. It was just like a great big lint mustache. And I uh, started focusing on driving again and I looked back and he had made it into a little Hitler type of mustache while we were driving. So you, you get that preoccupation with certain, certain objects sometimes. <clears throat> And finally, <clears throat> and this is one that can be very challenging for not only individuals with autism spectrum disorders, but also their families. <clears throat> and this is where the individual is either overly sensitive or they actually are considered undersensitive to certain stimuli. Now, I'm going to briefly just talk about the undersensitivity because I want to talk a little while about the oversensitivity. A lot of times, those individuals who are classified as being undersensitive, those are the individuals you'll see sometimes who will do self-injurious behaviors. They might bite themselves or slap themselves because they're trying to get some feeling in their system. Now we sometimes see that type of behavior too in other people. I've worked with several individuals, both as children and adults, who have been kept in closets or isolated for, for days and weeks and, and months at a time. And sometimes those individuals do those same behaviors. I was working with an adult who was institutionalized, and he, had, he was blind. He was also intellectually disabled. He didn't have autism. But he had been kept isolated for many years. And one of the things that he would do, he would walk a little while, and then he would yell at the top of his lungs, and as hard as he could, he would slap himself. Now, that, the reason that man was doing that was because for all those years he was so isolated, he didn't have stimuli as we do. Nobody was there to talk to him. He couldn't see, and so he had to do something to fulfill his time. So that's what he did. You're more likely, though, to... And, and that, again, self adverse behaviors, th that's not the majority of individuals with autism spectrum disorder. But you do see many of those individuals who are oversensitive or have that hypersensitivity to certain things. Smells, sounds, the clothing of some type. And I'm going to, get to tell you a story later on tonight about an example with that with Zach, but I'll tell you another story. <clears throat> when Zach was little, when he was a baby, I used to take him into the shower with me and just to play with him and stuff. And he would bite me and he would scratch me and kick me and he'd cry and scream. And again, when your child can't talk, you don't know why they're doing that. And when we would go to the beach, he would never go down to the ocean. And there was a pool. There were multiple pools at the hotel where we stayed. And he would not go to the one pool. When you got close, he would start fighting you. And again, we didn't know why. Well, eventually, when he learned to talk, we said to him, you know, why are you doing that? And he said, the sound of running water hurts my ears. <laughs> so what we did is, <clears throat> I have a background in mental health too, so I'm, I'm very familiar with different you know, techniques to work with individuals. And so what we started doing to help him was we started what's called um, desensitization, systematic desensitization. And we would take Zach into the bathroom, we would cover his ears, and we would turn on the shower and we would have him stand there for a little while. And then after we'd done that for a few days, we would turn it on and we would go like this. So he was exposed. And then eventually we would take him in there and turn on the wire and he would just stand there. And we would talk to him so it was a, a positive experience. And then eventually we would have him get into the tub with the shower on. Now you can't get him out of the water and he loves fountains and the ocean and stuff. But at that time, he didn't because it was so painful to him. He's also extremely sensitive to popcorn, Doritos, certain types of crackers, and certain types of cereals. And that is a very, very painful experience for some individuals. Certain types of lighting can be painful. Again, clothing of some types. That's why it's not uncommon for people on the spectrum to wear their socks inside out because that little ridge on your toe can be very, very painful. The symptoms, of course, have to start in the early developmental period, and as I mentioned, that means within the first three years of the individual's life. 
Those symptoms have to cause a significant amount of impairment socially, occupationally too. Many times people with autism and the spectrum cannot work because there are too many other things going on. And it actually impacts their ability to function in life. And many times, not always, but many of those individuals are not able to, to live on their own because of, of certain issues associated with the disorder. Another thing we always want to keep in mind is that you cannot diagnose a person as having been on, or being on the autism spectrum just because they have an intellectual disability, meaning they have an IQ under 70 or below. Now, the majority of people with autism itself do have IQs that are under 70, but that alone does not create an autism diagnosis for an individual. Okay, Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. Um, I realized I'm getting ahead on, on time, so I have to edit some of what I was going to say. Um, well, let me just say that. Uh, Oh, I have a question for you, John. I want to clarify something. So you're either on the spectrum or you're not. It's not like you can voluntarily join it like a, like a club, right? Yeah. You cannot. You, are either, you either meet the criteria or you don't. Depending on the situation and the behaviors. Now, sometimes, though, it can be somewhat subjective. Because I, I sometimes will get... I, I do, or I've done a lot of consulting work, and, and schools would call, have me come in and they'll say, you know, do you think this child is, has autism? Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, because sometimes we see similar characteristics on other disorders. Sometimes I see that in children who uh, have hearing impairments. Every once in a while I'll see a kid who the school thinks has autism, and they actually may have some form of schizophrenia. Because one of the, the characteristics of schizophrenia is that withdrawal. And sometimes there is a fixation with schizophrenia, too. So, so some neurotypical person couldn't just say, oh, yeah, I'd like to try out this autism thing. No. You, they cannot. It's not like you can purchase it or subscribe to it. You cannot. I haven't found it at Walmart yet. <laughs> well, you know, somebody owes me a refund. Because, <laughs> man, I've been paying my dues all my life. I could think back to 10th grade when the photographer came around to our school and to get, take our picture for the high school yearbook. And, you know, then we'd be given this little tiny picture to take home to our parents. And, uh, you know, it, it, the parents were then uh, given the offer to, to purchase a set of photographs. So I took it home to show it to my mom. And, uh, and she says, you can't have this picture in the high school yearbook. <laughs> And I said, she said, you, you got to go back and get a new picture. I said, Mom, the, the photographer's just there for one day. This is it. She says, well, I'm not buying that. And so what provoked such a reaction in my mother? Well, it was that look on my face. Now, I can remember what that photograph looked like because I've seen that look on my face in photographs taken throughout my life. Not every photograph, mind you, but... Typically, when the camera catches me unaware, catches me in what I call my default mode, you will see that look on my face. The eyes are not really engaged with the camera. They're, they're kind of lowered. And the smile is not a genuine smile. The whole effect is like what you'd expect to see in a picture of a hostage who's been held for two weeks beaten and starved, and then at the point of a gun told to smile for the camera because we got to prove to the folks back home that you're alive and well. That's what it looks like. Now, uh, this was years, even decades before the concept of an autism spectrum existed. It was even years before the term Asperger's syndrome entered the public consciousness. So somebody like me was described in terms of, like, quiet. You know, I, I was, my nickname in high school was Mr. Quiet. Or you were said to be shy, or maybe even painfully shy. But you see, that word shy, it carries a negative connotation. 
you know, I had a girlfriend in, in the year I graduated high school, and, and she was an extrovert. Of course, I was an extreme introvert. And we used to joke with one another that opposites attract. And we, we grew closer, and we got eventually to the point where we would say things like, I love you. With her, it was easy. That, the words just rolled off her lips. For somebody like me, <laughs> that's a lot more difficult uh, to say. Even I, I might feel it, but it's still <laughs> difficult for me to get those words out. But she managed to get those words out of me on a couple of occasions. But I remember one time she said to me, you know, Jeff, I was shy when I was 12 or 13, but I grew out of it. And the implication was, why don't you grow out of it? And I would ask myself that question. Why don't I grow out of it? Why can't I be like everybody else? I, it felt like a, a character defect, and, and it would just take a force of will to overcome it. But I couldn't quite figure out the secret to doing that. So. I've lived almost my entire life feeling like a moral failure because I couldn't get over this. And keep in mind, this is well before autism or uh, Asperger's syndrome, you know, so I had to live with this dark cloud over my head. And of course, that leads to low self esteem. So, to bolster my self esteem, I would tell myself, you know, Jeff, you're not shy. You're, you're like, you're one of those strong, silent types. Like the, those heroes in the old Hollywood westerns. You know, the guy who saves the day and then goes riding off into the sunset with hardly saying a word. I said, yeah, that's you, Jeff. But now, uh, with the perspective of later years, I'm beginning to realize that those old Hollywood heroes themselves were on the autism spectrum. You know what that guy who's riding off into the sunset is thinking? He's thinking, you know that banker's daughter that I rescued from the bad guys? She's not bad looking. I sure do wish I could have chatted with her and gotten to know her better. But dagnabbit, when I'm around her, I just get tongue-tied. And I just look down at my boots and say, oh, shucks, ma'am. And then later when the townspeople were crowding around me and patting me on the back and shaking my hand and the banker's daughter planted a kiss on my cheek, and I was trying so hard to think of something witty and memorable to say so I could leave with a flair. But for the life of me, I couldn't think of anything. So I just hopped on my horse and rode out of there and without a word, and, and they probably think I'm a jerk. And here I am heading west when I really wanted to head east because I know there's an Arby's 10 miles to the east of here. The only thing west of here is Burger King. And I don't like Burger King because the seats and their buns get caught in my teeth. And I got the sun in my eyes, and I want to turn around, but they'll think I'm an idiot. And besides, the credits are rolling. So, so let's step back and analyze this guy's behavior, because he is exhibiting three or four traits that are common to us on the autism spectrum. So first and foremost, he definitely has a communication problem. Words are just not his thing. I mean, if the bad guys had challenged him to a duel with words rather than a duel with guns, he would have been a goner. Secondly, his best friend in life is probably his horse. Because I, speaking for myself at least, and I'm, I'm guessing this is true of lots of others on the spectrum, we relate better to animals than we do to people. I mean, I can relate better to my dog than I can to most people. The cat, not so much, but the dog, yeah. <laughs> so a third thing is that those of us on the spectrum tend to have a limited executive functioning capacity. By that, I mean uh, the, the, the mental capacity to uh, follow strategies or make decisions. And uh, so, so it, it, we can do one thing, but we're not good at multitasking. So you, you give this guy one thing to do, like rescue the banker's daughter from the bad guys. Yeah, he can handle that, okay? 
But then later when all these people are crowding around him and he's trying to think of something to say and he's wondering which way was Arby's and am I really in the mood for Arby's or am I more in the mood for Indian food? And how would it look if a cowboy walks into an Indian restaurant? You know, he's got all these things weighing on his mind and depleting his mental energy. And he gets flustered. And he makes the wrong decision. He goes west instead of east. Well, I can't tell you the number of times in my life where I've gotten flustered. And it's typically in a situation where you've got so many external stimuli or so many things to attend to and you've got to make decisions or uh, you know, it's like in my classroom, uh, well, nowadays it's worse because, like my statistics class, I've got three audiences to deal with. I've got students who are there physically in the classroom. I've got others who are attending remotely. And I've got a third group that relies on recordings that I make during the class that they will view later. So while I'm conducting the class, I have to be cognizant of all these things because uh, I will, on the computer, be switching from one app to another, like from uh, PowerPoint to Blackboard, or Blackboard to Smartboard, or Smartboard to StatKey, which is a statistical application. And it's taxing. It's quite taxing to my brain. And uh, after class, I am so depleted that I go back to my office and I collapse in my chair and for a good 20 minutes or so, I'm like a zombie. It takes me that long to restore my depleted mental energy. Uh, and, and you know, when, when your mental energy is depleted, it's really much the same effect as if your physical energy is depleted. So, you know, if I were to tell you it was like I ran 10 miles, it's similar effect. So um, OK, the fourth thing was this guy is uh, overly self-conscious. You know, he was heading in the wrong direction. Once he realized, he thought, I can't turn back. They'll think I'm an idiot. He's, you know, he has to uh, maintain this facade of the, the mysterious hero, you know, who, who doesn't make a mistake, you know. And, uh, and like, what would they think if a cowboy walks into an Indian restaurant, you know? He's so concerned about his image that he, he can't allow to appear vulnerable. And I think I could speak for all of us in that, you know, because we have what some people insist on calling a disorder, you know, uh, we feel kind of insecure about ourselves and we, try to maintain a facade, like, oh, yeah, I'm really competent. Uh, can't let anybody know that I'm really insecure about it, but uh, try to maintain that, that appearance, you know, and, and we're overly concerned with what other people will think. So, John, what's your take on all that? Well, <clears throat> what I'm going to be sharing with you now are some of my experiences of raising a son. And what you'll find as I talk I, I had some people make verbal qu quotes, and I'm going to play those quotes for you to kind of explain the impact that Zach has had, not only on myself and my family, but also some other people, too. That was several years, several hairs, and several pounds ago, okay, <laughs> when Lisa was pregnant with Zach. Zach is a genius who is trapped. Rick Wilson, Zach's uncle. My brother-in-law, Rick, who was just wonderful with Zach, always had said that about Zach when he was little because he saw the potential Zach had. But sometimes the autism aspect of his life held him back from being able to do everything that that potential was there for. I'm going to raise him like a normal little boy, John. Zach's dad. I have always shared about Zach with my students because I want my students not to only know what Dr. Taylor knows, but I want them to know what John Taylor lives every day. And right after Zach had his diagnosis, and I had shared my, with my students I was concerned, 
I came back to a class and one of my students asked me, they said, Dr. Taylor, what are you going to do? And I said just that. And that's what we have tried to do throughout Zach's life. We've never used autism as a crutch. We don't use it as an excuse. Because too many times parents do that and no one benefits from that, especially the child. Because we have to address the issue at hand. That is so important. Zach is like a building that has many windows. Most of the windows are cloudy, but every once in a while, a clear one appears and I see a typical little boy, John, Zach's dad. When Zach was little and he, and he couldn't talk, many times he would, would be within that autism spectrum and he would be doing self-stimulatory behaviors and, and being very isolated. But then every once in a while, it was as if he came out of that spectrum and he would be this little kid who would want to interact. And that was the best way that I could describe that behavior. And Jeff said something similar one day when we were having a conversation about that. I included this picture here because there's a very, very touching story, at least from my, from my perspective, about this. I grew up in a family who hunted and fished and, and hiked all the time. And I always had dreams of my sons doing that with me. So when they were born, one of the first things I did after they were born, I got them lifetime hunting and fishing and trout standing. <clears throat> well, to get your, your permanent license, you have to take the hunter safety course. And so my brother and his two sons and, and Zach and Ian and I all went to take the hunter safety course. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when we got there, I, I went up to the instructor and I said, I just want to tell you that my one son has autism because sometimes Zach would maybe self-stim or need to get up and kind of walk around. And he said, oh, don't worry. He said, my niece has autism. And it turned out that she was actually a student at the college where I worked at that time. And, and so I said, okay. Well, we went through the class. We all took the test. One kid didn't pass it, and it was Zach. And so that instructor came to me and he said, hey, how did he do? And I said, he, he didn't pass. I said, he was the only one of us who didn't. And the instructor said, he said, I want you to bring him into a room where it's quiet, and I want to give him the test orally so that he can better focus on the questions instead of being in a room that there are 50 people and noise and stuff. He gave the test to Zach or or orally. Zach passed. I sat there and cried. Zach never knew why I was crying. But that man made an accommodation. He, 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 Zach took the same test as everyone else, but he took it in another form, just as we do with other students with disabilities. We made that accommodation for him, and he passed the test. Zach has never gone hunting with me because the sound of a gun going off is very painful to him, and I would never force him to do something that I know is painful. But he, he did get that, <laughs> that license, and that's a, a really meaningful thing to me. Jeff, I'll turn it back over to you. make you understand what it feels like to, to live on the autism spectrum. I mean, the subjective experience. So to do that, I had to come up with an analogy that you could relate to. And you know, this analogy I came up with works so well that I'm beginning to wonder if it's actually true. It goes like this. You, so, you see, before we are incarnated, we exist in the mind of God. So when God thought me up, the intention was that I would be incarnated on a planet where people have diaphanous bodies and where they communicate telepathically, you know, like Saturn. But through some mix-up, 
and I'm certain Satan has something to do with this, I got incarnated here on earth instead. And I find myself here in this fleshy body. And I'm surrounded by earthlings. And I've got to find a way to relate to and interact with these earthlings. But that's problematic. It's problematic because the primary mode of communication here on earth is this activity called talking. And it's just incredibly cumbersome. I mean, what you have to do is you, you first have to get words to represent certain ideas. And then you've got to put these words in a certain order. If you don't get them in the right order, it won't make sense. And then you've got to utter these words. Now, you don't have all day to do this. You've got to do it in the moment, like within a second or two. And it's not sufficient just to utter the words. You have to accompany the words with facial expressions. Or, or you may have to use different tones of voice. Or you might even have to use what these earthlings call body language. So you see what I'm up against. Now, another thing is that on Saturn, the kinds of things that are communicated are things like E equals MC squared, or phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny, or the mass of man lead lies of quiet desperation. You know, things like that. Nobody on Saturn communicates something like nice weather we're having today. And please, I don't want to hear any jokes about the weather on Saturn, because I've heard them all before. Actually, the people on Saturn like their weather. Those 100-mile-per-hour winds feel good on their diaphanous bodies. And they, they love clouds. The denser and swirling the clouds, the more swirling clouds, the better, you know? That's why people on Saturn on their vacations like to come to Garrett County, especially during the months of November through March, because during that period, the conditions here most closely match the conditions back on their home planet. You know, Martians, on the other hand, they, they prefer more desert areas. They're particularly fond of the American Southwest. But, but uh, Saturnians, they like places like Garrett County or Alaska or, or, or you know, interestingly, Finland. Well, anyway, that's a digression. The thing is that it wouldn't matter how stiff the breeze or how swirling the clouds. Nobody on Saturn is going to communicate nice weather we're having today. You see, if you communicated that on Saturn, they would look at you like you have one head. Well, that's because Saturnians have two heads. So if, if you only have one head, you're weird. Now contrast that with Earth, where I would say at least 90%, if not 99% of what's communicated, are things like nice weather we're having today. So, you know, I, uh, well, let me just say that on Saturn, so as you might guess, they, they don't spend a lot of time in conversation. You know, a typical conversation might go like this. First person might say, equals MC squared. And the other person says, yeah, the mass of men lead lies of quiet desperation. That's their conversation. Unless, unless they wanted to have a, an extended conversation, in which case the first person would say, yeah, phylogeny recapitulates ontogeny. And the second person would say, yeah, except on Earth where it's the other way around. And that would be, that would be their extended conversation. And then they would go out and enjoy the weather instead of making a name comment about the weather. So, you know, I think that I've gotten better at talking over the course of my life. But I will never, even if I live a hundred Earth lives, I will never be as good at it as, as these Earthlings because their words just pop right out of their mouths like popcorn. The few words that I speak just kind of roll out of my mouth like a bowling ball. So you see, 
I've lived my life like a stranger in a strange land. And John, I'm just wondering, you think uh, Zach perceives himself as a stranger in a strange land? Well, when we wrap up tonight, we're going to discuss Zach's perspective of having autism. <clears throat> Raising a child with autism has been very challenging for me. At times, I did not have the strength and courage to do what was best for Zach. This put a strain on my marriage as I was often filled with anger and resentment towards myself for not doing the right thing. Lisa, Zach's mom. 80% 80, 80 of families who have a child with autism end up getting divorced. The highest rate of any group of people. Lisa had a very, very difficult time accepting that Zach had autism. And, and one of the big factors was that her family, especially her mother, would not even mention autism about Zach. And she would get very defensive. And I'm going to show you a quote later on tonight from her. And so Lisa was kind of torn between, do I follow mother or do I follow my husband? And, and it caused tremendous issues in our marriage for many years. It really did. The day that I was told that Zach had autism was filled with many emotions. Relief, fear, determination. Relief to know why Zach was not like other children. Fear of what his future would be. And determination to treat him like any other child. Lisa, Zach's mom. Lisa now is, I mean, she totally accepts and everything about Zach having autism. But that diagnosis of any type of condition can be a very traumatic experience for a parent. You have so many different feelings. You have sadness, you have anger, you may have embarrassment. And there's a lot of turmoil too because nobody gives you the skills to know exactly how to handle this situation or that situation. And even though I trained for years in that, there were still challenges I experienced because you're dealing with a child who can't speak, who has behaviors that can sometimes become aggressive. Now, one of the things you'll find if you're working with individuals who have, have autism especially is that once that individual does speak, and not everyone does ever learn to speak if they have autism, but once they do, you typically see the fifths and the outbursts go down, which is exactly what we saw with Zach. Because finally, instead of having to hit somebody because he was mad, he could say, I'm mad, or I hate you, or, or whatever it might be. So that being able to vent verbally can be a major reducer for any type of outburst at the individual. The most impressionable memory I have involves Lisa. It was Zach's first year in the program and we were having our Halloween party. We were all gathering in our circle for circle time while the parents stood in the back of the room watching. Zach did not intentionally like circle time and would run to the back of the room yelling, no, no, no. As the rest of the children were singing and playing games in the circle, I remember the look on Lisa's face. I believe it was at that moment that she realized something was different about her son. Mrs. Bennett, Zach's preschool special education teacher. I remember the first day I took Zach to the preschool handicap classroom. And we walked into the classroom together. And there was a classroom of students in wheelchairs and some who had Down syndrome, students who had more severe disabilities. And in my mind, I thought to myself, my kid is not supposed to be here. But then I just got this feeling like, yes, this is the place he needs to be. Mrs. Bennett was a phenomenal teacher. She was a truly phenomenal teacher. And Zach Taylor would not be where he is today without her and without Mrs. Smith, his first grade teacher, or Mrs. Currents, his fifth grade teacher, or Mrs. Allen, his 10th grade English teacher. All of those individuals had a tremendous impact on Zach Taylor. But another group of people who really, really helped Zach were the aides who were assigned to him throughout his schooling. Each of those women deserve much of the credit for Zach's success in life. And, and he is very, very close to those ladies. Even though we have moved, they still send him presents and 
he calls them and they call him and send him letters. But those ladies, all of them, whether they were a teacher or an aide, were an integral part of his success. And one of the good things was that Lisa and I worked in a cohesive unit with all those individuals. So it wasn't one person, it was a group of people working toward the betterment of a child, in this case. Having a brother with autism is hard. Sometimes he would get extremely annoying by saying stuff about people he shouldn't tell. When I'm with the friends, he wants to butt in and change everything we are doing. Finally, he will get extremely annoying when I'm trying to concentrate. He will run up and down the hallway. Ian, age 13, Zach's younger brother. A lot of people don't realize, but siblings of individuals with disabilities many times are under a tremendous amount of stress. It can be embarrassing. If your friends come over and your brother is saying things that is not something that's correct to say, there's embarrassment to that. If you see your brother at school and he is doing something that other kids his age don't do, there's embarrassment. There's also some anger. I, I've, I've done a lot of work with siblings of individuals with disabilities. And there is anger because sometimes, in, in some cases, now we've never done this with Zach, but in some cases, families actually almost drop the rest of the kids and they focus on just the child with a disability. And, and that's not a, a positive thing either. Sometimes, too, you have to look at it from a perspective of the, the typical child. I don't like to use the word normal. I don't like that word. Nobody's normal. Um, but <clears throat> Ryan, especially you, I just want you to know that, okay? Um, I probably won't be working here tomorrow since he's my boss. But, um, <clears throat> but a lot of times those individuals don't grow up with a typical sibling. So Ian didn't have a brother who wanted to play or talk or, or ride bikes with him. So you, we always want to keep in mind about those siblings because they have needs too. After Zach was born, I became the grandfather of a special child. It has been a wild ride. One day I might be down thinking of the things Zach will never do that my other grandkids will. Then I get a high by knowing Zach makes the honor roll every time. Then he becomes a member of school's junior honor society. Sometimes when Zach is here, we will talk about ancient history. He will tell me about the leaders of Rome, Greece, and, and many other countries, as well as how major battles were won or lost. He might also tell me about some battles of America from the Alamo to Gettysburg. This is a thrill to have him tell me about all this history. This information is all self-taught by either looking it up on a computer or reading it in books. You do not question what Zach says. He will go to the web page and, and show you he is right. In closing, my life with a grandson who is autistic has been a wild and interesting time. I wish I could be here for the next 15 years to see what will happen next. Papa, Zach's paternal grandfather. I thought this was a beautiful quote. I really did. When I asked my dad to do this, he said, oh, he said, I don't know. He said, I don't, he said, I don't write well, very well. He said, I don't know what I would say. And I said, Dad, you'll, you'll say it fine. And I included this here because Raising a child, any child, but especially a child with a disability, takes more than just one person or two people. And, and I've been very, very fortunate. I, my mom and my dad, my sister and her husband and their children have been very, very supportive and helpful. And that's what it takes to truly make success when everybody works together in that situation. Now we're going to talk a little bit about some situations where pe people may have said things that were probably not appropriate to either Jeff or I. Do you want to share your story first about your girlfriend? Or you want to wait? Oh, oh. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, uh, last week when uh, John and I were discussing our presentation, I just related something to him and I said, you know, I don't know if I'll include that. But, but he, he said, no, you, you really should include that. 
So, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier my, my girlfriend, the, the year I, I graduated high school, and, and, uh, and how we, you know, you know, grew close to one another. Um, and uh, so I was then in my uh, freshman year of college. And I went away to college at Penn State. And, uh, and uh, at that time, Penn State uh, was on a trimester system, so there so I would go back after the Christmas break earlier in January than uh, my girlfriend, who went to a different university, uh, would. So uh, I remember sitting one day in my dorm room and get in a knock on the door and open it, and there she is. And, you know, she had trained me by that time to, oh, when your girlfriend walks in the room, you're supposed to hug her and kiss her. So. Uh, so I went to hug her, and she kind of like, uh, yeah, don't, you know, don't hug me. And, uh, uh, and, and she had this stern look on her face, and, you know, you, I have to talk with you about something. And, uh, you know, she was on her way back to, to her university and uh, made a detour to stop at Penn State to visit me, uh, to give me certain news. And uh, so... Uh, she said, you know, my mother told me that you don't want to be with a guy like that. And, uh, and she went on to list all these things that, that, that I was doing or not doing that, that were, you know, strikes against me. I don't remember everything on the list. But one thing I do remember was uh, the, the stuttering. You know, she says, you stutter. You know, and, and probably I did, especially when I'm in uh, a stressful situation, I might stutter. But that was just one of many, th it was like a list of things. She went down the list. And, uh, and then and she said, you know, you're going to have to change or, or else I'm going to stop going out with you. And, uh, well, what could I say? You know, I was dumbfounded. And so then she left and went to her, to her college. And, and I, there I was left. I was kind of like lying there on the floor bleeding to death. <laughs> That's how it felt. Uh, so, uh, you know, I know now that she probably didn't mean it quite the way she said it because, but I took it to mean, well, this is it. And then, uh, Valentine's Day was approaching, and I thought, well, what's the status of our relationship? And I, I was not going to send her any card or anything. I was going to call her nothing. But my roommate said, it was like the day before Valentine's Day, he said, you know, Jeff, you've got you, you to gotta do something. Well, it was too late to send a card, and I didn't want to call her. <laughs> Stupid me. I, I went to the florist, and I, <laughs> I ordered a bouquet of flowers and had it had it sent to her, you know, so she got it on Valentine's Day. And she was just overjoyed with this uh, bouquet of flowers. And, and she, you know, we had talked like a day before, and I was just very not into it. And, and she told me she was crying because of the way I talked to her. But, you know, uh, still, those words, you know, I remember words. That's a characteristic, maybe not just of me. I think it might be others on the spectrum that uh, we're very sensitive to what we hear. And, and we remember words, especially cutting remarks, for a lifetime, really. And, uh, well, anyway, to make a long story short, uh, you know, I, I just really didn't communicate much with her that semester. I, I, at Easter time, I, I, uh, she said, are you coming home for Easter? Oh, oh no, I, I can't get a ride home. I, I really did go home, but I just lied. Because I, I didn't want to see her. And then I knew when the semester ended, well, I got to see her. So you know, arranged to go to her house. She lived about, oh, I don't know, 10 or 15 miles away from me. and Went to her house, and I, I thought, well, yeah, I'm going to do the same thing to her as she did, did to me. I'm just going to, you know, break it, break up. And uh, I got there, and, like, she's putting, it, like, she's, now I can see that she was trying to turn on the charm. You know, she, she made sure she kissed me when I walked in the door. And, and she said, oh, uh, see, we weren't originally going to have dinner, but she's, oh, what won't you stay for dinner? You know, my mom's cooked dinner, and, and we would like you to join us. So I, I stayed reluctantly, and, 
And that evening, I was just sitting kind of like a, a dummy on the couch next to her. I wouldn't really put my arm around her or anything. And, and she, and well, oh, I won't go into the rest of it because uh, it, it's just, the, the, the long story short is that, uh, you know, that was the last night I saw her. And, and I remember walking away. I, I remember walking away and, and looking back, and, and I saw her standing in the doorway looking kind of forlorn. But uh, that's unfortunately how that ended. You know, I didn't mean to tell you that story, but John put me up to it. <laughs> it's a story, though. I, I really do. <clears throat> right after Zach was diagnosed officially, Lisa had to take him to a well child visit. She was a stay-at-home mom, and, and she took him to the doctor. And so she went to the doctor, and when the doctor came in, she said, I just wanted to let you know that he was just diagnosed as having autism. And the doctor's statement was, ooh, that's not good. Well, that upset Lisa quite a bit. So she called me. Called me. I worked about 30 miles from home, and she was crying. I said, that's okay, honey. I'll take care of it. So I get in my car, drive to the doctor's, walk in, and I'd say, I said, I would like to have all of our records right now, please. We'll be going to another doctor. And we did that day, and we found a wonderful doctor who was excellent with Zach and, and Ian and the rest of us, too. And for years, that individual was our family doctor. <clears throat> from from a, the time our boys were babies, I took them every Sunday grocery shopping with me. I like to grocery shop. I know that sounds weird, but I do. And I would put them in the buggy, and we would go do our shopping. Well, <clears throat> one day, this was, again, Zach couldn't talk. Zach and I went to Walmart, and I pushed him in, and there was a little restaurant in Walmart, and it had a popcorn machine right at the, at the opening of the restaurant. I pushed Zach in, and I started to put him in the buggy, and he started screaming and crying and just flailing his arms. And so this man, th th he must have weighed 400 pounds. I'm not exaggerating. He came out of that little restaurant, came up to me. He grabbed his belt buckle, and he said, you see this? Use it. Well, I started to say something to a person that you probably shouldn't say in a Walmart, especially a 400-pound man. <laughs> and then I, I thought to myself, why should I waste my energy on a person of this type? And so I just pushed him off, I, you know, went off. Years later, of course, now I know why Zach had that fit, because we were right beside the popcorn machine and the pain was there. But you don't know that when your child can't talk. Zach and Ian both played soccer one year, <clears throat> and we were in the, the bleachers, and this lady came up to me and turned around. She sat down, turned around, and said, you know, all the kids think he's weird. They just don't know why. <laughs> Again, that's not an appropriate statement to make about somebody's child. And the irony to this is her daughter was an, a lobbyist for a group for autism. As I mentioned earlier, my mother-in-law really caused a lot of contention, and, and she wouldn't even talk about Zach having autism. But so many times in front of Lisa and I, when we would be around company, she would always say, well, they say he has autism, but I don't believe it. Now, my favorite quote is the final one. I was in Walmart, and a lady who ran a daycare came up to me. She stopped me. I, 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 I knew this woman's daughter. I knew the woman just a little bit. But she just comes up to me, puts this her cart up to me, and says, you know, none of this would ever happen if you'd given more money to the church. I, I've never figured out that correlation, but for some people it must be there. <clears throat> now, as I said earlier, we feel so fortunate to live here in Garrett County. We love it here. Of all the places we've lived, this has been our favorite place. And... Unfortunately, though, even here in Garrett County, there is still some discrimination. And I'm going to give you an example. Zach applied for a job here in Garrett County. During the interview, the person who was interviewing him, after she found out he had autism, she made this statement. We already have one of them working here. I know of another place here in Garrett County that made the statement, we don't hire those kind of people. So 
And again, I'm not cutting down Garrett County. This is a wonderful place. But discrimination touches all areas of the world. It's just not in West Virginia or New York City or Miami. There will always be some people, not the majority, but those few who still make it difficult for whether it be a person with a disability, a certain race or whatever, to succeed. You want to say anything else before I finish up? Well, I'll just say that, um, you know, it wasn't until much later in life that I even knew anything about Asperger's syndrome, say. It was only like, oh, about 10 years ago, maybe a little over 10 years ago, when a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, said, or, or she said, you know, Jeff, I think you, you, you might have Asperger's syndrome. And I'm like, what? You know, I'm not even sure if I knew exactly what Asperger's syndrome was, but it didn't sound good. I thought, what? You know, you're my friend, and you're saying I have Asperger's syndrome? So I was kind of like in a snit. You know, how dare she say this about me? And, and maybe, uh, maybe that lasted a few days until I researched Asperger's syndrome and probably went to a website and where they have a checklist. And I went down the list and check, check, check. Yeah, well, okay, I have Asperger's syndrome. <laughs> um, now, uh, uh, yeah, I was in a snit for a few days, but then gradually, I began to see it entirely differently. I found it as being empowering because, well, now at least, I had an excuse for my behavior, you know? And uh, so that explained a lot of things. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> years ago, I, uh, I used to buy this kind of bottled tea and for a while there, they, they had a, a challenge to their customers to come up with a six-word memoir, and they put it on the inside of the bottle cap. And there was one that I just absolutely love because it's appropriate to me. It goes, it's, it's by someone called Ben Sheldon, and it goes, I have Asperger's. What's your excuse? <laughs> I love that because believe me, you know, I, I told you how I don't like the word disorder, but but I see some unbelievable behavior from so-called typical people that just appalls me. <laughs> and I can't believe, why don't they get labeled with the disorder? You know, is that, is that acceptable behavior? When I, I'm the one who gets labeled with the disorder. So, uh, so that's why I love this quote. And I kept this bottle top all these years, and I will keep it for the rest of my life. <laughs> when I think about Zach's future, I think about this quote because I don't know where Zach will be in 10 years. He, he, he works now. He still lives with us. But maybe 10 years from now, there'll be a cure for autism. And maybe he will want to do that. Maybe he won't. Nobody knows what the future holds. But in Mrs. Allen's 10th grade English class, she had each of the students write a paper about themselves. And Zach's paper was called, Where I Come From. And I want to finish up tonight with him reading that short paper. I come from a world of autism, mountains, observing things, finding money, and the chocolate challenge. I like river rides and at the Grand Teton, the beach with its warmth and sand, the clay center with sculptures teaching rain on things. I like movies. Keys, and my DVD player, my computer, and soft things. I come from a world that is really okay with friends, a dog named Maggie, and a brother. I like Olive Garden, Grandma's Cooking, and Dave and Buster's Restaurant in South Carolina. I like Terra Alta, like my parents and my grandparents. I like War History and the Alamo, my yard, and a large tree with a swing where I can sit and dream. questions you might have.